Hey, I don't know how many of you heard, but while the uh, people were signing in, I was playing this tune in this rhythm right here. And I like to play that at the beginning of all of my sessions because it is actually the song that started my research, um, my love for music, my love for um, crossing cultures and the mixing of cultures and the evolution of that. So um, <clears throat> that song is El Carretero by Guillermo Portabales. It's a Cuban song, but I first heard it when I was in Senegal, when I was about five years old. And I like to tell this story because, you know, my, my uncles used to take me out uh, after dinner and dinner was late. It was like at 11 at night, <laughs> we would end. And uh, my uncles just for digestion would take me out walking in the neighborhood. And so I'm sitting there holding their hands and they're all above my head and it's really dark and I think I'm really cool because I'm out there at night with my uncles. And um, in the distance, I start hearing just what sounds like a scratching sound. It was like, shh, shh, shh. And as we got closer, I started hearing that clave that you just heard. Bop, 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 bop. And I was like, okay, what's going on? And as we got closer, because back in the day, the, the doors of those parties used to always be open. And when I neared the front of the door with my uncles, I noticed that that song was playing like this. And people were clapping to the rhythm and that shaking sound that I heard. Was people's feet on the tile they had dragged in sand from outside. But I noticed that it was in Spanish and that people were clapping their hands like that. But we were in West Africa in Senegal where people don't speak Spanish. So immediately I was like, wait, there's something going on. Even as young as I was, I could recognize it. And that started my obsession with African rhythms and with understanding how they actually kind of are ubiquitous. They're almost everywhere in modern music. So um, today we're here to discuss that. We're here to discuss that African rhythmic structure, how to hear it, how to apply it, and how to enjoy it, really, <laughs> if you've had trouble in the past. Um, and learning it is like learning any language. It is a language and learning it like any spoken language is a matter of cultural perspective. Um, it's a matter of worldview and understanding how that language is seen and understood by the people who created it. So to that end, you know, like if you're learning, if anybody here has learned a language, they know that, yeah, you can study it written, but until you speak it with someone and until you have an opportunity to be within those communities, whether it is there on site in their country or outside of it, at least if you're within those communities, you can have some kind of immersion and immersion is really important to understanding and absorbing 100%. And it's even more important when it comes to African rhythms because Harmonic music is written down and has been pretty well written down and codified. African rhythms, not so much so. So that immersion is, immersion is even more important. <clears throat> now, don't worry, we will get into the music for those of you who are musicians and into the technical aspect of it. But it's really important that I bring this point up before we begin, because understanding that perspective is understanding that the music and the analysis of it is not separate from the day-to-day -day culture of where this music came from. That being said, one of the things that I find educators miss when it comes to African rhythms is the fact that, yeah, we have words like syncopation and layered rhythms and all of that, but to understand it, to understand where it comes from, we have to understand that in the origin of these musics, there is no fourth wall. In Western culture, Greek culture, theory of, of, of uh, of theater and all of those things, there is this concept of the fourth wall, the fact that the artists, even though they're performing for the audience, they are not acknowledging the presence of the audience. And the audience is there uh, to be spectators. In these African cultures, the audience is not there as spectators. <laughs> they're, they're there as contributors, as attendants to it. And the way the music started, the way these, and whatever tribe you're talking about, from the Zulus all the way to the Wolof in West Africa, the way the music is understood, performed on a day-to-day -day basis, and the way it began is with the fact that there is no fourth wall. Therefore, the, the voice of the musicians, the bodies of the musicians, 
the voice of the attendants and their bodies are also instruments and inform how this music is structured. Now, if you see it from that perspective and you come back to, um, to counting music as one, two, three, four, but see it from that perspective, you'll start to understand that it's something different and you'll start to hear it as something different than standard breaking down of fourths to, to eight to sixteenths and 30 seconds and on and on evenly. Um, so when it comes to that immersion as well, physical participation, since I mentioned that the body is an instrument, is very important. So if you're trying to understand these rhythms, when we go into this within this uh, workshop and I go into claves, three, two rhythms, rhythms of Brazil, uh, rhythms of Cuba, rhythms of the United States, it's really important to understand that while you're learning with other people or by yourself to beat your foot or to clap your hands. This is, by the way, my first time doing a session virtually. I normally do this in uh, person. And I have people clap their hands while I'm playing so that they can actually participate in it. And again, those of you who are musicians also know if you are, especially a singer, and you're learning to harmonize, the first time you harmonize, it might sound, it might be really difficult to find the notes. You know, you're like, what, what is everybody doing? But as soon as you're given your note and you hold on to it and you sing it, the notes that everybody else is singing start to become clearer. It is the same thing with rhythm. Rhythm is tension and release. So with rhythm, when you're trying to learn this, it's very important that you beat your foot and try to do it with independence, like clap the clave, but beat your foot on the downbeats to understand that kind of mental dexterity and uh, ambidexterity, that independence that is really necessary for understanding layered rhythms. Uh, a lot of musicians I've seen play rhythms without beating their foot or understanding where the one is compared to those rhythms. All right, so let's get into it. So every rhythm in the African diaspora has a core foundational beat. And uh, in, in Western culture, they tend to say that things are syncopated. I don't really like that term that much because if you look in the dictionary, the definition of it says something along the lines of, oh yeah, it's off beats or it's the placement of rhythmic stresses or accents where they would not normally occur. And the questions we need to ask ourselves is where they would not normally occur to who? And seeing it from that perspective can be dangerous in understanding what this is. So what is the clave since this class is about the clave? The, the clave is a Spanish word, uh, which normally means things like key or peg, but it can also refer to keys as in harmonic keys and rhythmic keys. In this particular context, the clave refers to rhythmic keys. Now, um, some people that might be from other places would be like, oh, okay, well, we understand it from another word. The importance is not the word as much so because the word is just semantics. The importance is the fact that clave describes a concept that is structured. It's not happenstance. It does not happen as an accident. It's not a, uh, a disturbance in the flow of regular rhythm, because that definition comes from the European dictionary. <clears throat> that being said, let's get started with what I was doing before. When I'm playing this, and I'm gonna play it with the rhythm for you actually. Yeah. What you're hearing right here, I hope everyone can hear it. Can everyone hear this? This right here is what they call son clave. Now, the reason we start with clave and why Cuba is important when it comes to that is because actually Cuba in a rhythm called the Habanera was the first time that African rhythmic structures were recorded in writing. So it's not to say that, oh, Brazil doesn't have their own, Panama doesn't have their own, Dominican Republic and all of those other, everybody has their, their own interpretations and their known names for these particular claves. But the most popular one is the word clave because of the fact it was the first one that was written down. And that's why I tend to like it because it's much more respectful of what our African ancestors have done. Now, going into the other thing is we're going to talk about the clave as relates to the United States at first, because this is where we are. We are in the US, so you know we gotta give respect to what this is for all of those of you who are immigrants or anything like that. 
And the first time the clave was heard in the United States and became incorporated was in New Orleans. And it was called the Spanish Tinge. And it was at the, the very beginning of what they call American music, because before that it was Western marching band, waltzes, classical music, things like that. Um, it was a song called The Entertainer. Now, most people don't know the name of the song, but it's the one that goes. Now that goes. Uh, that song right there. Da, 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 that is The Entertainer. But what people don't realize is that the entertainer is actually that three two clave, but that clave rhythm is being played by the instruments and not the drums. So what you're hearing is the drums doing a marching band going but it's so that rhythm right there was the first time it was heard in the United States, and it's also the first truly American song. And I'm putting that under quotes because there are opinions, but the bottom line is that song was considered to be the first original American song, not based on marching band music of Western Europe and the rest of the diaspora. <clears throat> now that clave, which is in the entertainer, is actually found all over American music. Most people, um, some people don't realize it, but it's in everything we do. So um, I will give you an example. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with the obvious ones. Hand on hand on, have you heard? I was going to get me a my inverse. If that my inverse don't stay. Okay, so I hope everybody could hear that clearly. Um, but that right there in the US was called the Bo Diddley and it was used within uh, that song and that particular style called Hambone, which was playing percussion on your body. Now that particular rhythm has been used, like I said, all the way up until the modern day. Uh, George Michael used it in this song. Uh, well, I guess it would be nice if I could touch a body. Oh, no, not everybody. It's got a body like you. Not necessarily my favorite example, but I want to make sure that people who know pop music understand what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> now, within this concept of uh, Cuban clave, um, to understand it as well, again, if you're coming from the way we've learned music uh, out here in the United States and in Europe, we tend to count things as one, two, three, four. But as I basically demonstrated an example of the clave, which is called the three, two in Cuba, three, two son clave, one, dun, 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 dun. And people be like, okay, this is, it's a rhythm that's, that's cool, but why does it, why is it so important? Why is it so foundational? Why are things constructed on it as if it was a key. Well, I shouldn't say as if it was because it is a key. The reason why is, I'll give you an example, is because that dun, 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 if you count it like this, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But then you count it like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. It begins off the one as opposed to the first one I showed you, which starts on the one. That one that begins off the one, they would call it the two, three clave versus the three, two. Um, <clears throat> That being said, that 3-2 and that 2-3 clave, even though they sound approximately alike, they are actually binary opposites to musicians. So I'll give you an example. In, in salsa, where they use this kind of clave, a song that some of you who know salsa might know, goes like this. Uh, 
So if you notice, the horn line, that melody I was singing, actually goes with that clave. It goes like this, four, one. If that was reversed to the three, two clave I did before, it would not fit in the same place. So not only are the horns based on that, but the bass line of the song, which goes like this. Uh, I hope everyone can hear the clave here. As you can tell, if you can, the bass line is following that clave as well. Pa, 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 pa. If that clave was turned around and a musician or somebody who was playing the clave did not understand that concept and played it opposite of that in that song, the other musicians would know and the actual song would not sound right. Um, so even though it sounds like a very small change underneath, um, it's, it, it's actually the opposite key. It is the binary opposite. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Pablo, if you can uh, send the link one more time, I think I'm getting a bunch of people asking me to resend the link. You can post it one more time on Facebook. We just sent the link to everybody on Eventbrite who registered. Okay, so awesome, good, thank we you. We can put it on Facebook too, just to make sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes some people might not be on one or the other. <laughs> All right. <laughs> OK, so um, in talking about this, th the importance of the drum language in sub-Saharan Africa, which was transferred to Brazil and uh, to the Caribbean and to the United States, um, is not only a language, uh, it's, it's a worldview that you can actually see people applying when they do their day-to-day -day work. My aunts, my mother, uh, family members, uh, back in Senegal, when they were doing any kind of work, if music wasn't playing, at some point, somebody would start sucking their teeth and doing one of these rhythmic claves that are, again, key structures of the music. Um, and that's the kind of thing that people are immersed in from birth, but is not something that is like DNA. You can actually learn it as culture. Anybody can learn it if they are immersed long enough. You know, I've, uh, I've met enough people of uh different races and backgrounds who have blown me away you know i'll, I'll call them my blue-eyed soul brothers <laughs> because of their understanding of this uh, but nevertheless immersion and understanding of the culture is extremely important now uh in the united states as i just showed you you hear those rhythms in the instruments, but the drums tend to be playing straight. And the reason for that is because drums are made illegal in the US, much more so than anywhere else within the diaspora. And that changed the interpretation of, of how the music developed. They had to be, uh, our ancestors in the United States had to be uh, very innovative <laughs> as, they, as Africans had been with their own religions in the Caribbean and the, um, and in South America and kind of disguise it a little bit. So instead of having really strong rhythms that people recognize as African um, in the United States, those rhythms by, were actually put on the high end instruments by great musicians like Scott Joplin, who wrote uh, this ragtime song, the, the Entertainer, but and where you also hear it on guitar and on bass, but generally the drums because of the American backbeat and the snare on the two it doesn't sound quite as distinctly African, so to speak. Um, 
But the only place where they did actually have those drums was in Congo Square in New Orleans. And even that was not for a long period of time. But there's no surprise that that is a particular place where jazz began. And if you know about the second line music in New Orleans, you know that that rhythm is everywhere within the music. And it's also within the uh, source of jazz because the instruments translated that within their improvisation and within the um, structure of the music. Now, the relationship is that within the 1800s, there used to be a ferry boat that used to travel between Cuba and New Orleans twice a day. Musicians were actually exchanging like crazy <laughs> at a time where people didn't realize that it was being done. People tend to conceive of music from one country and the other as isolated. But when you look at it from the perspective of the African diaspora, there is no isolation. These uh, divisions of French, English, Portuguese, and all that don't really apply to the concept of the rhythmic structure we're talking about. So <clears throat> now we are going to get into the tresillo. Now, this is, again, a Spanish name for a very important rhythm. The rhythm I'm talking about, tresillo, is what I like to call the carnival rhythm. You find this everywhere the, within the African diaspora, Brazil to New York, anytime they have carnival, you'll hear. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And depending on how it is translated on the drums, whether or not uh, one of the three beats ends up on snare or on the bass drum, the tonality of the instrument um, determines the nature of how that rhythm sounds and how music is structured above it. So I will give you an example. Please bear with me because again, I normally do this in person. <laughs> As you can hear, the clave of that, which means the key rhythm of it, is simply this. You've heard it before in carnival music. Those of you who know Zouk, Soka, dance hall is in there. But because of where the rhythms are in this particular case, this is Brazilian bayon, which is used in fojo for those of you who dance fojo. And it sounds like this. Now, again, I got to ask, can everybody hear me clearly? Kate, Pablo? Just a quick comment. We can hear you fine. If okay. anyone's having problems, please post in the chat and we'll try and work it out on the chat. But it's sounding good here. All right. Sounds good. As, a, as opposed to that very same rhythm, if you switch it around and actually add a snare to it and take the triangle out, it's all about the tonality of the instruments and the accenting, the articulation of the instruments above it. So that very same clave, if I were to slow it down and put a backbeat on it, it would sound like this. Ah, 
which is basically Jamaican dance hall, and which is the source of what that worldly, hugely popular music, reggaeton, that we're all listening to, or some people are listening to today. Um, so that's to give you an example of the tresillo. There are multiple, multiple iterations of the trio, of the tresillo and the different ways that it can be played. In zoop music, it is the same thing, except it is only the hi-hat playing the tresillo. Okay. So um, it's about, at this particular point, it's about 7.30. Is there anybody who has any questions? Because we may be about a third or halfway through this at this moment. Going once, going twice. All right. Oh, somebody has a question. Pablo, okay? Uh, yeah. Um, should I come uh, show my face? <laughs> oh, only oh, only if you're comfortable with it. I'm good. Hi. Very nice. Yeah, it's nice that you're talking about Tresillo because it's like everywhere. But you were talking about the timbers of other certain instruments because there are, when you go back to the, the pila, we talk about the pila and in, um, in the danza before, you know, the, the you know, with Kachao going into the song and to the song Montuno with Arsenio, you do have those different timbres of pila being played on cascara or being played on, you know, the bamboo shells and stuff like that and different types of instruments going way back. And then the, the marumbula as well, you know, for the bass lines, for the tumbao. You know, so there's different, so many different things. And then it's great that you talked about the ragtime about Scott Joplin, because also what's really cool is the New Orleans thing with Mexicans playing ragtime. In uh, John Storm Roberts' book, he outlines, um, you know, the Mexicans who been who were playing, you know, who were part of those groups. So that's something very interesting in terms of the Latin tinge. You told the Spanish tinge and Jelly Roll Morton calls it the Latin tinge, which is really such a big part of it. And a lot of people forget about that because it's very interesting because uh, in jazz, they leave out the Latinos. Oh, yeah, that's and a big that, conversation in it's itself. A, it's a huge <laughs> conversation. I'm really glad that you bring everything up because it's really nice the way you did your YouTube things and you present what James Brown did because there is a two bar phrase and like Cole Sweat. Oh, I'm getting there. I am getting there. I know, Pop, and you're, you're really hitting it good because it's really good that you're covering every single ground of it. And what's his name that did the thing 20 years ago that left out, uh, forgetting his name, the, the, the documentarist guy that everybody's annoyed at right now. Uh, uh, music or otherwise? Uh, documentary. Burns. Oh, Ken Burns. Burns. Yeah. Ken Burns uh, and yeah, Ken fun. Burns. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah. So that's that's. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much. I, Good yeah. to see you. Good to see you. Hi. Good to it, see you too. It took a minute to get in here, but uh, I don't know what happened. I was going through hoops. Maybe I got stuck in the Lincoln Tunnel. But no, it's that's really interesting because then it's the whole thing about the ragtime, and I thank you for bringing it up there. And it's really interesting because that's the that's that I'm happy that you're, you're saying that because I, I was at a, a conference some years ago and they really specifically talked about the ragtime and the clave in the ragtime. Absolutely, and absolutely. It's, it's extremely important. And because it's so subtle within it, people don't identify it uh, right away with the rest of the rhythms within the Caribbean, uh, South America and Africa when it is exactly the same thing. Yeah, because it's the, that cultivation that was happening at the time with so many people, especially you talk about New Orleans, so many people were there, so many different people, and people don't talk about the Mexicans being part of the, you know, the ragtime. And, you, you know, the, the last book that John Storm Roberts wrote, Latin Jazz, he specifically speaks about that. And Absolutely. So, you know, anyway, thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your commentary, definitely. It helps me to know that those people are understanding where I'm coming from and how to cater this. So I really appreciate it. It's really good, thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, what I'm basically doing at this particular point um, 
is giving you different examples of how the idea of these core rhythms that are not even, um, that, are, that are, have been called um, uh, happenstance or where they don't belong or random, that they are structural. They are as much structure as diatonic harmonic structure. And the idea that, that you can layer them, the clave is a two-part rhythm. It's a, the way it would have been described in classical music would have been ostinato. What is the key motif of the music you're playing? You're hearing a two-part, that, 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 that. And they're kind of binary. You can flip those over and when you do, it actually creates the difference between one and zero if you can conceive of it that particular way. Um, uh, I'm giving you examples of, that, of the clave, not only Cuban, I'm using the Cuban word again because that Spanish word is a way to codify something that does not exist in European languages. Okay, so clave is not, if you missed the beginning of this, clave is not a hardcore word that anyone who uses African rhythms is necessarily going to use, but it is the most universal. Now, uh, since I'm giving you examples, I'm going to move into every, uh, to the six eight. Uh, if there are people on the line who don't understand or who do, are not familiar with six eight, this particular uh, African rhythm that is used sometimes in jazz, that is absolutely used um, south of the United States, um, absolutely used in Latin music, tends to be interpreted as more uh, folklore. Uh, more traditional, not used as much in pop music. And uh, I'm going to give you examples because people tend to think that the 6 8 is only interpreted one way, like tak, 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 which is one version. Okay, so I'm going to give you more than one version of how it can be interpreted and also how that was brought into the United States again in a more subtle fashion. Uh, the 6 8 United States would actually be called the 12 8, which you have in the 12 8 blues shuffle. Uh, it's a subdivided way of hearing it, which um, West Africans from the area of Mali, Senegal, uh, and Guinea uh, are more originators of. <clears throat> but uh, enough talking. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. So. So that six, that, that six, eight or 12, eight blue shuffle was even suggested in the blues, in the earliest blues where there were no drums or it was just guitar. Um, uh, actually, I shouldn't say earliest blues. By the time it got to blues guitar, um, it was so subtle that you couldn't really tell that that's what they were doing. You had people like Robert Johnson doing things like... Uh, let it be so there you have a pulsing rhythm going down but actually what's being suggested is one two three four five six one two three four five six so what you're hearing one two three four five six at, at that speed is what's translated at as 12 8 one two three four five six nine two eight nine ten eleven twelve i can't even count that fast but the bottom line is that's what you're actually feeling in that blues So, and I give you an example of how that changed in Chicago when they actually started putting instruments in. It started becoming a little bit more obvious. And it's kind of like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. might recognize what that is right there. That six, eight African rhythm is dead in the center of how that's felt and how every instrument is interpreting it. Now that evolved, that very same beat that you're hearing as something that's more old school blues, you know, you might be thinking Memphis and all of that. 
is also this. <laughs> all right so i hope that that was clear to everybody who could hear it where those similarities are and how the blues itself evolved into james brown's funk and how that 12 bait blues shuffle can be used the clave as well <laughs> is within james brown's funk even in four four time but uh, that's probably the clearest that I can show you because 6-8, again, is translated normally as uh, a more folkloric kind of African rhythm. And that's just a matter of perspective and how it's been translated. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to give you another example of how that 6-8 works. And it is another kind of funk now. <laughs> This is a Congolese six eight. So I hope you can actually hear Again, that that is a six eight, but a completely different interpretation of what that six eight sound is. The six eight, the six eight, and the twelve eight do fit over each other, but they give you a different swing. But I was using actually the same one to interpret both of those rhythms. So what I just played is a rhythm from Central Africa, Congo, that uh, there would be called the Mutuashi, and there you have a, th that overlapping feeling of the 6-8 over the 4-4, four, four. you can count it as one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. Or you can count it as 6-8. They're both overlaid on it. And the tension within African music that distinguishes one music from another is not only the tonality of the instruments, um, as well as the language and how the articulation of the vocals is done, but also how they are pulling more towards six eight or more towards four four. There are there it's, it's a shade of gray. It's not black and white. There's a lot of space that you can actually pull the music closer to four four or closer to six eight, and it gives you a lot of distinction. And that's one of the things that's um, that actually distinguishes, let's say, one tribal music from another. Uh, on top of tonality. Um, so these are the kind of things that you learn to start hearing as you actually participate and immerse yourself within these rhythms. To take it back to the beginning of what I was talking about, using your body within the process of listening, playing, conceiving of the music, arrangement, will help very much to ingrain how this works and how it's translated into European concepts and how it's translated into rock and roll, funk, dance music of any kind, uh, trap, you, you name it. it, it's all in there. I'm going to show you another example of that 6-8. Well, not that 6-8, it's actually a different 6-8. This is 6-8 is from Senegal. So this is where my family is from. And uh, it's a 6-8, but you'll notice that it does not feel at all like what I just played for you. It goes like this.
And if you had to break down the clave of it, it's in the hand claps. It's right here. This is actually a 6-8, but it's not that commonly heard in the West. Think, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the way the whole thing works together, I'll give you an example of a song. So I hope uh, everyone could hear how that is a 6-8, does not sound at all like the 6-8 I played before it, um, but nevertheless, it is a 6-8 that you identify as Senegalese Sabar from West Africa, the most Western point. So I hope that really shows um, how just one particular rhythm can have many, many, well, one particular core rhythm, one particular clave can have many, many different interpretations and can have many different kinds of structures built on top of it. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> hmm. Let us go to Brazil now at this particular point so we can show another variation of this. Now, excuse me for taking some time to do this. I had actually had this set up on a much more complex system only to realize it didn't work on Zoom. So I am improvising. <laughs> Let's see. All right. I got a particular love for Brazilian rhythms myself. And um, it's one of the things I really wanted to get to. Okay, let's look at some samba. Let's see, partido alto. All right, we're gonna go with the basic uh, samba rhythm. And samba is very, uh, is a very rich, very rich music. Normally within a samba, you'll actually have multiple claves going on at once. So, so you'll have like a tresio on top of uh, the cinquio clave, for instance, in, within samba. And as some of you know, they have a whole lot of instruments, a whole lot of layering on top of it. But one of the layers uh, that I like the best, one particular type of rhythm that sometimes the pandero will play and the rebolo is the partido alto, which means the high part. <laughs> and it goes like this. I 
I love this particular rhythm. So anyway, to give you an idea of how it's used. Do capo do braço. Um lamento triste sempre com vou. Desde que o índio guerreiro foi pra cá te ver, o índio lá cantou. Bem, meto. Um canto de revolta pelos ares. De quilombo do Palmares, onde se refugiou. Fora a luta dos incompetentes, bela quebra das correntes, nada adiantou. E de guerra em paz, em paz, em guerra, todo o povo dessa terra, quando poder cantar, cantar de dor. Oh, 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 I'm telling you what I saw today. I believe. I'm sorry. Okay, speaking out of school, but it might be maybe that witch shot. Let me remind everyone to mute if you're uh, if you're listening. I'm gonna try and mute whoever has their mic on. Did we have feedback? Is that what it was? No, someone left their microphone on, but I'll I'll try and mute people if they leave their microphone on. Okay, got gotcha, you, got gotcha. you. <laughs> was I feeding back? No, no, it was fine. If someone <laughs> left their mic on and we're talking to them. Right on. <laughs> okay, so um, that was an example of a general samba uh, with a particular emphasis of the Parti do Alto, which I showed you by itself. Now, that Parti do Alto part, I'm I particularly love it because. Again, when we talk about the African diaspora, these rhythms have traveled and been exchanged. There's been cross-pollination between the South, the North, across the Atlantic, back and forth since the late 1700s, multiple times over. If people think that pizza left Italy, went to the United States, and then came back with Pizza Hut, that's nothing. <laughs> it's zero. The amount of cross-pollination and how things have influenced different places and come back around is almost limitless. So to that end, I got to give you one of the examples that I like the most. What you just heard again is a general samba with that Parti du Alto emphasized. And I want to show you what happened in the 70s, because in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, that Cuban clave, like the Cuban, real Cuban interpretation of things started getting into the big band music of the United States um, with Dizzy Gillespie, Chano Pozo, and people like that. But in the 70s, Producers like Quincy Jones, um, artists like Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, um, started using Brazilian rhythms and it's not talked about as much. And it's one of the things that I really wanna emphasize. And Brazilian rhythms tend to fit better over funk actually. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why that, that, um, that they chose that. And because it was really unexplored other than, you know, at the beginning of Bossa Nova, but people did not really see how it could be used on a much more aggressive, let's say, level for the dance floor. Now that rhythm, as you, as, as you heard it before, this right here. If I were to put a backbeat, an American backbeat on it and take out the conga drum, it would still be the same rhythm, but you would be able to feel something totally different. So I'll give you the example of it. This is it with a backbeat. Everybody hear that? And what you can play now on it is this. Thank <laughs> you. 
Take a walk out through the door and dance and shout. Shout it over. All right. So I don't know if y'all can see or hear, hear that clearly, but um, the Jackson 5 Shake Your Body Down to the Ground is very much a samba with the Parchido Alto emphasized. When you hear um, Michael Jackson at the beginning of things like working day and night and things like that, he's going. <laughs> All he's doing is doing a samba with his mouth. And when he's going, he's doing a cuica. That cuica sound that you normally hear going, all of those artists were listening very closely to not only um, Tom Jobim and all of these artists that were doing bossa nova within the 60s, but the Tropicalia movement. The, the great artists like Gilberto Gil, Caetano Veloso, Javan, all of those people had interactions with American artists, with, with Quincy Jones, with Stevie Wonder. As a matter of fact, Gilberto Gil and uh, Stevie Wonder are very good friends. Um, and these musics influenced each other in ways, in the same way that the music of the diaspora as a whole developed through cross pollination, through um, migration. And you can, I, I'm a firm believer that you can actually trace history, not just how music is structured, but the actual history of people through these rhythms and through this music. And again, it's not just listening to the music, it has to do with the dances as well. The, in the dances that people do to samba, to, okay, one of the things I was, I, I had was to be able to demonstrate that, but I'm gonna stand. <laughs> when you're, when you're, Dancing or let's say, let's see. We'll take it back to that Cuban rhythm. As I said, the body is part of the music, part of the lesson. So as you're hearing the clave here, where the bass part would normally be, which they call the tumbao in Cuba, would be. And if you watch the dancers, they're going. So this is what they'll dance in a rumba, as opposed to what they call a guapeando and salsa, which is this. This would be a guapeando as opposed to the side to side. But the emphasis, the the the. The tension between the two, three, and three, two part of the clave are emphasized in the in the movement of the body. The basic drums are on the feet. And if you watch rumba dancers, they'll come up to the drums and do this and have movements with their shoulders. So you have a division. Normally you see three drums in traditional African music. You have a low, mid, and high. In many instances in the diaspora, the division is represented in the body. The high drum will often be represented either by your feet or your shoulders, and then the other two drums by the other part. When a dancer in rumba is going like this and will come up like this, the guy who's playing quinto, who's doing the majority of the talking, will respond to that dancer making that movement. So when he does this, you'll hear. So these, so these dances were actually part of what informed how the music was structured. And what the dancers do inform how the music changes and vice versa. So again, as I said at the beginning of it, the dancers are co-conductors. You know how you'd have a conductor in classical music in the middle, especially if you have a large ensemble. The string section, everybody in the string section is going to hear the music delayed because it's so far away, they have to follow the conductor in order to keep time. It's the very same thing when you have the lead drummer, the, let's just say the master of ceremony <laughs> within all folkloric uh, African music is either the lead drummer or the one who is actually chanting. Like for instance, in Yoruba culture, it'd be the Akpon. And when he is chanting, he has to not only pay attention to what the drummers are doing, making sure that all the rhythms are correct, 
his own chant, but pay attention to what the people are doing around him and how the energy changes. He has to multitask all of those things. So again, multitasking, beating your foot, let's say on a downbeat while playing more complex rhythms at the same time, which is basically a translation of the rubbing your stomach and tapping your head. It's extremely important in understanding African rhythms in understanding how the clave fits and how the clave is interpreted. <clears throat> okay. Okay, now we are at eight o'clock. So I wanna make sure I'm not talking too much. If there are any questions, this might be a good time. We did, we did have some questions. I remember Jason Walker had a question. Ah. Um, let's see. Are you there, Jason? Can you ask it or should we read yeah, it? I'm there. Hey, John, what's up? Hey, Jason, what's happening, hey. man? So a lot of times, there's a lot of instances where when you know, you're playing uh, rumba, the drums go one direction with the clave. But I've heard a lot of cases where when you get to 6-8, they switch that they switch which side they play on. Do you have any idea where that comes from or why that is? I, I do not, but I do believe it is more um, typical of Cuba itself, as opposed to when directions are switched in other musics, like for instance, it'll go in Sabar music, when it'll go from 4-4 four, four to 6-8 or 4-4 four, four to another interpretation of it, it doesn't necessarily flip where the clave is. So, to make it simple, no, I do not know why it tends to flip that way within within Cuban music. Not yet. But if anybody does know, I would love to find out. I'll chime in right now. The clave is not supposed to change. When you're in 3-2 rumba clave, because that's the thing, a lot of times if you're playing 6-8, like... It stays. It's just, mm -hmm. that's the thing about people thinking about the clave. It's just what direction you're in. It's not like it, if you cross, you cross, but you're supposed to stay. And a lot of times when people are arranging, if they're playing song clave, if it's in two, three, that six, eight has to be in two, three, or else you cross. You're just being on the same side. So it's not supposed to change. No, you're off clave if you do. But why the it, question is the question is then why there, there's a lot of examples of like patato, mongo, people like people that are in that in that region in that level that do this. They play across when it goes to six eight, and that's my question. I I, I haven't heard anything in the yambu or the drums and chant that anything that has mongo. I mean, I grew up listening to mongo, and I've never heard him cross the clave. It's it's either three two, because it's it's African clave. You know, and then also what um, I'm, uh, what he was, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the artist's name. I'm sorry, excuse me. It's And also the reflection where you are on the bombo, which is on the three side of the clave on the end of two. Right. Right. right, 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 right. Yeah, that's what you were, which was great that you were stating that in terms of room mm -hmm. dancing. It's on the, because the check, boom, but no, I have never heard, those guys don't even think clave. They just I, I'm aware, but there are still like if you go to uh, the album Potato and Totico, there's a number of there's a number of cases where they're playing it opposite. Well, maybe. What do you mean opposite? I don't understand. Do they? they I mean, play? if we're doing if we're doing six eight, uh 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 uh, I got the good. The, as opposed to. I, I don't know. I have to hear it. I mean, I have to hear it in terms of what the bell is doing, because a lot of things is really important is what the bell is playing. Because but, but the bell so, so, so that's I, 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 playing clave. It's 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 in the clave that, you know, that's all in there, just like Pila. Yeah, so so. Uh, I, if, if I can interject and, and you tell me, because I don't I haven't heard the piece of music that you're talking about, Jason. Yeah, I haven't heard that. But 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 one thing I do know that is typical in general when it comes to 
folkloric, uh, be it Yoruba, be it right. uh, Mandang, be it Bambara, it doesn't matter. One thing that I, I, I do know is that within, it, it, see, we, we can't call it a piece because it's a different way of thinking about it. Right. Within, um, whether it's a ceremony <laughs> or within the jam or whatever you call it, there may be an, an energetic change. Now yeah. you're not going to stop, you're not going to stop and then start. They, yeah. they will literally flip on a dime depending on what is happening in the room. And when they flip, like Senegalese music will go from 4-4 four, four to the 6-8 sabar abruptly, just with a call of the drummer. And it is yeah. not the same clave. Um, so I'm assuming, because I haven't heard that piece of music, I'm assuming that that piece of music is inspired by that kind of energetic change where what would normally be very, very straight where the clave doesn't change and all of the built accompaniments on top of it, campana, paella, all that other type of stuff right. is always according, papaella is always according to the clave that is there, depending on what, happen in, what happens in the room or in a ceremony or whatever the case is, that can completely change without stopping the flow. Right, and it can and it can flip to something different. So I, I don't know if that's what you're talking about or what that's what they embody. I'm going to interject, interject here for a moment. This is a very interesting conversation, but I want to let everyone know that afterwards, the video will be posted of this on Edu Cartes' YouTube page, and I put it in the chat. So if you have any questions or want to go back and view it or contact Jean Francis's contact and our contact will be there as well. And uh, I want to ask you, Jean Francis, have you compared ever seen anything in go-go music? That hints at the oh, yeah. clave and how do you when you you perform here in the DMV? How has that? How has your experience here been with American audiences and, and Washingtonians and Marylanders and everyone? So the 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 main difference that you'll hear between uh, claves in America, which are more understated, again, and the reason they're under more understated is because the drum was made illegal. There's a lot of social cultural reasons for that. Um, one of which is because the drums basically scared slave owners, <laughs> bottom line. And in the United States is the place where they had um, uh, slaves uh, one to 10, 10 to, 10 to one, basically 10 to one slave owner to slave. So it made it that it was much more um, confined and much more oppressed with, and, and much, more, much, so much more surveillance. So they had to be more subtle, but nevertheless, the three, two, the two, three, the tresillo, the cinquillo, the claves you hear in Brazil are all there. And as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why samba goes so well over American funk is because of this clave. That you find in samba. That right there, you also find it in go-go, but the difference is you have the swing that is suggested by that 12, eight, six, eight I told you about. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a swing to that clave. And so in other words, you can start that clave on the downbeat. So you can go one, two, three, four. You hear that in Brazilian music, but you also hear on the other side in Brazilian music. You hear one, two, three, four. Boom, bop, 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 bop. That one right there, felt with a swing, is what you hear in go-go and second line. When you hear the when you hear the cowbell player in go go music, he's going. It is exactly the same, just swung, um, and it's also the reason why that example I gave you of the Jackson Five shake your body down to the ground, it's so well that clave is there too. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> is that from the Off the Wall album? No, that is from the Jacksons. So shake your body down to the ground, even oh, though Michael yeah. performed okay, it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, because that's the Jacksons. Also was on the Off the Wall the al Off the Wall album. And it's and it's and it's a natural correlation because the majority of the producers and players on the on the shake your body down to the ground played on Off the Wall, it's including Quincy Jones's production. Yes, it's a classic album. It's just... Absolutely. <laughs> But I just wanted to ask one more question in terms of the samba clave, because a lot of times the scholars of sambas, they use the bossa nova clave. Mm -hmm. you know? 
they use all the Kaisha parts. And they were talking, they had a presentation here, uh, you know, like uh, the Teleko Leko in, in Samba, which mm. that timeline, which is a lot the clave thing where the Partido Alto and all that is part of it. But mm -hmm. they use that all the snare parts in the different schools, they, they, you can hear it, the outlining it and stuff. And then, of course, in, 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 in the, the, the Ketu, the Candomblé. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go oh, back and I want to listen to uh, the old Tatiko album. I want to see if they're crossing. I don't, a lot of times, like you were just stating, a lot of times people just stay in there and then you can hear between the four and the, the, the 12 because it's the same thing, like the same thing happened with the Graceland album. You know, that, oh, yeah. that downbeat, that whole thing. So that's probably what, but I, you know, the Cubans don't change the clave, not, and especially for choristas. You know, maybe yeah, especially for Gloria says they, they, they tend to be much more rigid and, and traditional with it. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, as opposed as opposed to Cuban timba, which is much more modern and the folkloristas aren't that into it as much. They're still using clavic structure, yeah. but they're much more likely to switch things around. Yeah, but a lot of times it's like because you can tell if it's like, you know, you say in two, three or say in three, two, you don't go three, two and then, you know, and then two. That's like total cross see mm -hmm. people this can, they, they understand that it's just phrased in a different spot that's all it is exactly but it, and it, it, so what i was explaining at the beginning of that is that it's phrased in a different spot but two three and two, three two clave even though the difference is somewhat subtle they're binary opposites right as you are saying if you were to flip them over within the music it would be considered cruzado which well, is the which is the equivalent of of musical dissonance in harmony. That's what it is, and I think a lot of people yeah. get that confused with it's just changing the direction of the clave. And there's a lot of classic recordings that have that, and one of them is Kimbara, because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you know, and then also back there were certain times that they were playing the 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 because Kimbara starts in three two but they're playing the the the, the, the tres copas side on the three side of the clave which they don't really do you know traditionally you know, traditionally so that's mm -hmm. what people get confused about this whole concept that's why a lot of the traditionals like patato and all those guys they stay within the patato even said i mean i had i was fortunate enough to hang out with them a couple of times there's only one clave he says three two but it just depends what direction <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I actually want to, um, Bob, a, a good thing. We, can we talk about um, the syncopation that you were alluding to in the beginning? Okay. The, the, the definitions, because when I was mentioning syncopation, I was talking about why I use the word clave, and a lot of musicians use that word, um, even though it is referring to the same concept. Is that what you're talking about? I think so. I was... Bob, can you, uh, are you there? Are you able to un un unmute? Who? Oh, Bob, I can't hear you. Are you muted? <clears throat> or if it's Bob. He's here. I think, well, you're muted right now. So I will, he's, I'll read his question here. Um, speak. Yeah. What you were talking, alluded to in the beginning about syncopation and it's more probably about the semantics and how it breaks down like that. Yeah. So what I was saying at the beginning is that um, clave is the word that a lot of musicians use and that I prefer for the concept that, that's been called syncopation in English and in Western culture. If you look up the definition of the word syncopation in the dictionary, literally, it is, involves a variety of rhythms played together to make a piece of music, making part or all of the tune a piece of music off beat. And then it says, more simply, syncopation is a disturbance of is a disturbance or interruption of the regular flow of rhythm. And then the last thing is a placement of rhythmic stresses or accents where they wouldn't normally occur. And what I said is that the question you have to ask yourself is where they wouldn't normally occur to who? In European structure, it is odd. It is happenstance. It is unpredictable. It is without structure. That's what they're saying, that syncopation is something without structure in that definition. Now, now the clave, on the other hand, basically um, is, is a word to describe that very same concept of overlapping rhythms, but it gives it at least uh, the clarity 
and as far as I'm concerned, the dignity of being a system, of being a structured uh, complex. Did everybody hear that? Uh-oh, am I gone? Yes, I heard it. Okay. <laughs> and I don't Did know- Did that answer the question? I think yes. He, uh, he, Bob, yeah. let me know that you were answering the question. And I don't know if it's his students, but I did see a lot of students from Rutgers were registering. And okay. uh, so we had the uh, illustrious participation of students. I don't know if any students want to say hello or ask a question. Feel free. Please do. I, it, it, this is the first time I'm doing this virtually. I'm feeling alone. <laughs> <laughs> African names of the six, eight rhythms. Can you share a few of those? Oh, OK. Um... All right, let's see. Uh, one, okay, one that I actually played already, which I played uh, earlier and I can demonstrate it again if you'd like, um, is the mutuashi. So the 6 8 that is used in Congolese music, um, both traditionally and in modern Congolese sukus, they actually call the mutuashi. And the mutuashi actually fits over um, the American 12 8, even though the American 12 8 is influenced by Mali and Senegalese. Um, and uh, Guinea and 12 eights. <laughs> so I hope that answers uh, for an example. Great, and, and, and jean Francis, you might not have the info now, but where, where can people learn more about the Black Atlantic? When is it coming out? Um, how, do, how is the best way to get in touch with you? Obviously, you can always reach us here at Ducarte, mm -hmm. go on our website or Facebook and we'll put you in touch, but what's the best way you prefer? So you, the, the Black Atlantic is on a holding page and will be fully operational within uh, two weeks, but you can find me, uh, you can find Black Atlantic on Instagram, and I am about to release the Black Atlantic Facebook page uh, tonight, as a matter Great. of fact. Wonderful. So yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah I'm about to make have, that public. We have two more people. Oh, oh and uh, by the way, by the way, Black Atlantic, in, in this case, if you want to find it, it will be BLK atlantic.com or facebook slash blk atlantic or instagram blk atlantic and we have uh, asta would you like to ask a question yeah hi yes i'd like to ask a question first i'd like to thank hey. you for having this event it, it was really nice and oh, so i'm a student you. at records too so um i my question is um you know why is it important um uh that clave is considered a system rather than like something spontaneous in like you know a social political sense Oh, in a social political sense. Oh, we're or in any here. sense at all. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, I'd, I'd love to go there too. I'm, I'm not trying to take the musicians too far away, but um, structurally, it is important because if you want to understand how to use it, in other words, like I was explaining how Quincy Jones and Stevie Wonder and all these people used. Brazilian rhythms and Brazilian claves within the funk to create what the Jackson 5 and Michael Jackson was doing in Off the Wall and all that, they had to understand how it works in order for it to fit and fuse over something else and not sound off or not sound lopsided. We were just talking also about the difference between 3-2 and 2-3 clave. If you weren't uh, here at the beginning, the 3-2 clave, when you count count for off of a four beat, you go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, which is totally different from if you count it like this, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. When you count it like that, it's actually the clave flipped over. And if you hear it inside the music, if someone flips it over, like for instance, in a salsa band, all the musicians might stop because to them, to their ear and you know art music is acquired some people can't hear jazz and think it's just noise but if you actually have been around it long enough you start hearing the complexity and you start really hearing what does not fit understanding that aspect which is structure it is not it is not random it's not happenstance it's like oh i'm just going to do this over here and it is off of a normal downbeat it is none of it is happenstance. All of it is structured and layered in the very same way that harmony is. You would never take out the, the third <laughs> or the seventh of a chord that you have that you built extensions on top of because it changes the very nature of a chord. It's the same thing when it comes to those rhythms. 
You have to start from the basis and everything that you build on top of that, the layers of rhythms that the horns, the bass, the guitar, the keyboards are using on top of it are based on that. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that every musician that does dance music is consciously aware of this. What I'm trying to tell you is that it's a language, like a child who learns English or French when they grow up, they don't really know the, they can't tell you what the structure is unless they go to the school, but because they grew up in the culture, that structure is innate to them, but it is a structure. They're not making baby sounds, they're actually talking to other people. And when you're using the clave in order to structure music, the musicians are talking to each other based on that language. I, I hope that answers, and please tell me if that doesn't clarify it. So now we have Jewel um, Sisoda. Would you uh, like to ask a question? Are you also a student, by the way? Yes, I'm from Rutgers. I'm from Professor Ramos' class. Um, yeah. So I just want to say thank you so much for your presentation because um, Honestly, I didn't really understand like um, musical terms and terminology. And I thought it was very interesting how you also incorporated the, the history. And I feel like Thank it's you. so important to, you know, bring Absolutely. that back. As you said, the origins is really, really important, especially um, when making music and, you know, um, educating people. So thank you for that. And so, thank you for thank you for noticing because it, it really, really is important into all this understanding all of this. There is no separation between the social, the cultural, political, and the actual practice of the music in original African cultures. Yes, of course. And um, as you said, like um, African influence on music all over is so amazing. And I love how there is um, a resurgence and appreciation of Afro culture and yeah. Afrobeats, and I, I love it. I like, it's it's amazing. Um, so. You bring up a very good point when you said Afrobeats. <laughs> yeah, Afrobeats, it's, um, it's, still a, it's still a really new genre that's like, it's always been established, but I think it's coming, it's becoming a little bit more Western. And we see it with dance hall, which I love, so. But actually there's, there is, even though, Afrobeats and Afrobeat share almost the same name. Afrobeat is Fela and the music he inspired. And Afrobeats is very inspired by Fela, but they actually are very different. They do use clave, but other than that, the way they are, the music is structured over the clave is very different. Afrobeats is a word, is a term that is used really to encompass a very new phase of mixing music of the diaspora with the aesthetics and, and um, equipment of hip hop. So you're using vocoders, 808s, all of those things, but in almost every Afrobeat song from Burna Boy to Davido and all that, yeah. you're hearing straight clave. And I mean, clave like I play it here. Yes, like if you, any, you know what I mean? It's going ka, 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 ka. And it shows you just like you're playing, pointing out the ubiquity, how universal clave structure is um, in the African diaspora, and because it is in the African diaspora, and in almost all of modern music, definitely in all modern dance music, it really is. And I and while you were playing these pieces, I like I said before, I wasn't really exposed to musical terminology. I didn't really understand it, but the way you really you explained it, I was like, wow, like this sounds so familiar. And I was able awesome. to think back to the dance hall music and um, yeah. He's like, I listen to him like, whoa, like that is clave. Wow. Um, the question awesome. I had, That's so encouraging. <laughs> thank you. Um, the question I had was really about like, in the, in, earlier we talked about, I think, Scott Joblin. And Scott Joplin, yeah. Scott Joplin, yes. And I wanted to talk about or ask you really about the Latin tinge and um, why, why are Latinos and Mexican culture really left out in a discussion when talking about jazz and mm. influence. So I, I wanted to know why, because that was also news to me. Um, okay, so th th there are multiple reasons why. Um, some are very clear historically, some we can kind of do some, let's just say political speculation. Um, primarily, at the beginning of these musics was also the beginning of, of nationalism, if you're familiar with history and sociology. 
and a lot of these countries were were um, really invested in defining themselves and being like, this is America and this is Cuba or this is Latin America and all of that. And also because the majority of these exchanges with the clavin within the musics happened um, with people who were not white. In other words, with people who were not in control of the country, they are the ones who would record and define what history is. And they were not recording how much communication was happening between, let's say, New Orleans and Havana, um, especially within people who were like Union soldiers, a lot of them who were Black were very comfortable going to the ports of Havana and then coming back to New Orleans. Um, so a lot of this stuff happened underneath and, and, and to mainstream American culture, which is Anglophone, they don't want to acknowledge necessarily or it's not, it's not natural or not... Uh, Subconsciously, they might they, they might have an aversion. They might have had an aversion to being like, yeah, um, what they were doing in Cuba <laughs> is actually a part of what makes us American. If you look at it from that perspective, I hope it kind of shows why maybe it wasn't emphasized that much. And then two, um, there were two times. One is at the beginning of American music itself with ragtime, 1800s, all that. You had a direct influence from Cuba to New Orleans. But and then and the age of Dizzy Gillespie, you had a direct influence again with Chano Pozo and people like that directly from Cuba. So it affected American music twice. But racial, uh, nationalistic um, perspectives are the kind of things that keep these things underground and make you have to kind of go digging for it unless we come to a cultural renaissance, which like what might be happening now with Black culture. So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And you're right. I have a feeling there there might be a cultural renaissance soon or it's emerging. Mm -hmm. Definitely yep. think so. Yep. Thank yep. you. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have my hand up. Mm -hmm. There are some books out now to the, to the student who just from- All Rob right, Rob. Sorry. <laughs> student who just, I put in the chat, uh, there's two new ones that are out, one by Chris Washburn, uh, mm. the other jazz. Uh, it's, it's, it's about Latin jazz in New York, Chris Washburn. And there's a new book from 1940 to 1980, uh, the, uh, Latin jazz in New York. Okay, and that talks a lot about Machito Mario Balza. Remember, you think about Latin jazz because, Bozo, yeah, yeah it's, you know, people think dizzy and, you know, okay, trying to post up, but before there was other things. So the John yeah, the big Star band era. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, you know, their cultivation because everybody, it was big bands in the forties that mm -hmm. was happening, but um, in terms of Latin, but there's also uh, the John Star Roberts, the Latin tinge. And then the one that you might be able to find the one that's in the library, uh, Latin jazz, uh, 1999, John Storm Roberts. That was a couple of books, but the one that Chris and Ben Lapidus just put out are really good. And I'll put it in the chat. I have to, I'll put it down for you guys. Thank you. A lot of stuff. Out. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. That would really help. This is the kind of information that really needs to get out, especially these days. Uh, do we have anybody else who got some questions? Oh, I think we're coming to the end. All right. Well, let me, I want to thank everyone that was here. We had a, this is probably the highest tense we had at one point. It was over 40, I believe. Really? Yeah. So it's fantastic. And thank uh, Bob and his students for coming as well. And thank you. Thank you. For putting Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you guys for having me. Thank everybody for attending uh, much more, much more of an attendance than I expected. And uh, yeah, I really look forward to doing things like this again. Yeah, I really absolutely. appreciate you guys. We're gonna upload this to YouTube at Ed Ducarte's page. So I posted it in the chat. If you want to also, if someone wants a copy of the chat, um, I can email it to them. Just to make sure you put your email in the chat or send it to me, and I'll I'll, I'll share that again. But thanks everyone. We have one more workshop yep. coming up with Bo Rason, who's um, a Filipino artist. And what day is that? My second. Uh, My second. Yep. Yeah. All right. And and I wanted to mention again. Uh, um, my social media, which is about to be streamlined, it's all BLK Atlantic. So the, the, there's a holding page on the website, 
right now, blkatlantic.com. I'm about to do the Facebook, black, uh, Facebook slash BLK Atlantic tonight, and the Instagram is already open. And you can also find me um, personally at uh, Jean Var and Jean Francis Var on Facebook. So Jean Var on Instagram, Jean Francis Var on Facebook. We're putting um, the Black Atlantic BLK and Jean Var on uh, in the chat, so you can copy that awesome. and take it down. And also, he performs in the DMV a lot. So <laughs> who knows when we'll get back? Hopefully soon. But uh, if you're lucky enough to be around here, you can see he's uh, one of Kate and my favorite performers here. So. It's an yeah, extra I'm point. looking forward to trying out my dance moves now that I understand a little bit more of the rhythms that are going on. So. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm glad it served a purpose. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you so much. Jean All right, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Bye bye.